This is Devin Sheets with Alpha Sound, and it's snowing here in Oregon, so that's obviously the perfect excuse to take out the subwoofers and do a little bit of testing. Today I'll be measuring the phase relationship between the ports on the Nexo LS18 subwoofer and the RS18 subwoofer. So first I'll run some noise and some tone through the subwoofers and collect the data. So let's look at the difference between the front-loaded RS18 subwoofer and the dual-ported LS18 subwoofer. The Nexo RS18 subwoofer is a front-loaded dual 18-inch box, but it is internally divided into two separate resonating chambers, one for each driver. So for this analysis, I'll only be considering one half of the box. In terms of resonating surfaces, we'll call the face of the driver the positive side, and we'll call the port the negative side. Positive will be red, and negative will be blue throughout. For the LS18, the face of the driver is enclosed in a chamber as well, so we'll refer to the opening of that chamber as the positive side, and the other port will be the negative side. This isn't the best terminology, but it works for now. Now you should know that all of these measurements were done without any of the Nexo processing. This is merely how the boxes behave acoustically with raw test signal. These results in no way represent how these boxes actually work or sound when the correct processing is applied. And as always, I'm doing a lot of speculation. So let's begin by taking a look at the total frequency response of the RS-18. We can see that the main resonant frequency of the box is somewhere around 32 Hz, and it has a pretty smooth response all the way up to 200 Hz where it experiences another resonance of some kind. Here is a look at what the positive side microphone directly in front of the driver captured. Overall, the response is pretty even, with the exception of a large dip right around the resonant frequency. Let's add the negative side response from the microphone in front of the port. We can see that when the negative side experiences a resonance, its output increases, while the positive side output decreases. This is also true of the smaller resonance we found up around 200 Hz. The combined responses make a bit more sense now, but as we'll see, this isn't the whole story. Keep in mind that typical subwoofer processing involves high-pass and low-pass EQ filters to shape the sound into what we all know is a good-sounding subwoofer. For now, we're looking at the raw, full-range responses of these products. Here is the response of the LS18 subwoofer. Quite different. We can see something like a mild resonance around 30 Hz, but a strong resonance around 60 Hz, with several very sharp dips and peaks above 100 Hz. Let's take a closer look at what's going on. Here are the isolated responses of the positive and negative sides. There's a lot to unpack here, so we'll look at it in sections. This part looks familiar enough. We have a negative side resonance which results in a positive side dip. Continuing on, we seem to have a positive side resonance with a negative side dip. This is because the face of the driver is enclosed in its own chamber, which has its own unique resonances, just like the negative side. Since it is a lot smaller, we would expect its main resonance to be a lot higher, and it is. So in looking at the combined responses, we can see that when the red and blue traces intersect, we get a summing effect here. But over here we get the opposite. Compare this to the RS18 response, where there is a summing effect at both intersections. What's the difference? For this, we're going to have to switch gears and look at some phase plots. Here's the phase plot for the RS-18 as it concerns the phase of the negative side in relation to the positive side. This might be hard to understand at first, but think of it as a comparison between the red and blue traces, where the red trace is the reference or standard, and the blue trace is what is being assessed. As a guide, let's add our frequency response back into the mix. To understand the phase plot, we'll focus on the first resonant frequency. At lower frequencies before the resonant point, the air inside the box is not resonating. It is simply moving back and forth equally with the motion of the 18-inch driver. This means that every time the driver moves out away from the box, producing a positive air pressure, air is equally sucked into the box through the port. This push-pull relationship is represented on the phase plot as being at 180 degrees. As you can probably imagine, this means that the sound from the driver is canceled out by the sound from the port, and the final volume of the subwoofer at those frequencies will be very low. And we can see this happening on the far left side of the graphs. As we move upward in the frequency range and approach the resonant frequency, 
we see the blue trace of the port begin to spike upward in volume, and the red trace of the driver begin to dip. And we can see that the phase relationship of the red and blue traces is shifting towards zero. By the time we've gone completely through the resonance point, there's been a complete flip in the phase of the negative side. This is because the nature of resonating air is such that non-resonating air is a bit like a stream of water, where the water itself is actually flowing in a direction, but resonating air is like the ripples in a pond after dropping a stone in the water. You see the waves move in that direction, but the water itself isn't going anywhere. And so because of some rather complicated physics, which we won't talk about in this video, once the air in a subwoofer begins to resonate, it is possible for the air pressure produced by the driver and the port to be completely in sync with each other and not canceling out. And this is what we're seeing here, and it is what allows the red and blue traces to sum perfectly throughout the rest of the operational range of the subwoofer. Now, it's interesting to notice that at the upper extreme of the response, there is another resonance in the port, which causes the phase of the port to flip again back to 180 degrees, and we can already begin to see the cancellation effect by the sharp downward slope of the combined frequency response. And generally speaking, every time the box reaches a new resonant frequency, the phase will flip. So now let's look at the phase plot of the LS18 subwoofer. Again, very different. We seem to have a resonance of some kind right in the middle of the operational range. Sure enough, looking at the frequency responses, we can see the expected resonance of the negative side, before which the phase relationship of the positive and negative sides was 180 degrees, and after which it flips to zero. But then we have a resonance from the positive side at around 75 hertz, which results in a dip in the output from the negative side and flips the phase relationship. It is important to notice that the phase of the negative side hasn't changed. It is the positive side which has changed because the chamber into which the driver is facing has finally reached its first resonant point. And as expected, it is a lot higher than the first resonant point of the negative chamber because it is smaller. So now we see why there is a summing effect here when the phase relationship is zero degrees and a cancellation effect here when the phase is 180 degrees. But then why does there seem to be a summing effect here when the phase is zero, but also a summing effect here when the phase is still 180? Should we expect the frequency response to dip during the entire section of the 180 degree phase? The answer to this has to do with the nature of summing and canceling, which I've also covered at length in my videos about cardioid subwoofer technology. For there to be cancellation at a frequency, the phase relation has to be 180, but also the volumes of the two sources have to be very close to each other. Summing is more gradual, allowing for a wider variance in volume and phase. So here we can see that the volumes of the red and blue traces are nearly equal, and since the phase is zero, we get a summing effect. But during this range where there's a lot of activity and disturbance from the resonance point, the volume difference between the red and blue traces is very big, and so the red trace is left pretty much alone to be the only one which is primarily shaping the final frequency response of the subwoofer. Continuing upward with a phase of 180 degrees, there is cancellation in the final response when the red and blue traces once again approach each other in volume. And then of course we can see a slight resonance point from the negative side which results in a flipping of its phase and therefore a flip in the phase plot, just like when it hit its first resonance down at around 35 hertz or so. And way up at the extreme edge of the frequency response, we can see another resonance from the positive side. And if we could see up even further, there would continue to be alternating resonances and phase flips from the positive and negative sides. Once again, this is why we apply low pass and high pass filters to the box so that the final response ends up sounding more like a subwoofer. In another video, I'll try to take a look at what Nexo decided to do with the processing to these subwoofers. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please let me know by liking and following AlphaSound on social media, and then share this video with your subwoofer friends. Thanks for watching.